And we'll cover four things in this quick lightning round. One is, what is DICE? Secondly, how do we perform DICE? And then I'll show you some common DICE findings. And then finally, we'll talk about who do we offer DICE for. So what is DICE? This was first described by Croft and Pringle in 1991. This is a picture of me doing a DICE just a couple weeks ago. What it is is it's a visual inspection of the upper airway during drug-induced sleep. So we're usually using propofol to induce sleep, looking in the airway, seeing where the obstructive obstruction is happening. Interrater and test retest reliability have been demonstrated in prior studies. And there have been studies that show that this mimics natural sleep well. But it's important to note that this just mimics non-REM sleep. So we are not mimicking REM sleep in this situation. And then how do we perform it? So here's the picture of me doing it again. This needs to be done in a controlled and monitored setting. With, I do it with an anesthesiologist, and as do most people, I, I know of some maxillofacial surgeons who have propofol capabilities that will do it with a maxillofacial surgery partner, but I think for the most part, people are doing this with an anesthesia colleague, either in the OR or a procedure suite. I have done this in both settings. Procedure suites are nice because they tend to have faster turnover, but both are great options. Pre-procedure medications are glycopyrrolate. I give that to anyone that can tolerate it and topical neosinephrine spray, usually in the pre-op area right before rolling back is great. I used to give topical lidocaine spray, but there was a study that came out showing this can impact obstructive patterns, so I no longer give that unless we're having a lot of difficulty with the patient sneezing, which happens occasionally every time the scope enters their nose. Then once you're in the operating room, I usually stay on the gurney, especially if I'm doing a bunch of these in a row. It's just faster. You don't have to move the patient back and forth. Uh, I stay on the gurney. You start the propofol infusion almost as soon as you hit the room because it takes a while. I start it around 80 micrograms per kilogram per minute. We just do a propofol drip, no benzodiazepines, as those will, of course, impact the obstructive pattern. Then I'll check in with the patient every minute or so. We're checking to see if they're responding to stimuli. I'll ask them their name, ask them how they're doing, and then slowly titrate up. I'll usually go by 25 or even 50 micrograms per time, especially in the beginning, to kind of get sleep onset. And then you're looking for not responding to verbal stimuli and snoring, and that's really when you're ready to stop the drip at that level and start your exam. I use the flexible fiber optic laryngoscope. It is nice if you have suction available, whether it's in line with the scope, that can be great, or just a yank how or a flexible suction. Even with the glycopyrrolate, there tend to be a lot of secretions that can impact your ability to visualize the airway. And I always record the exam. It's nice to go back and re-review and to show the patients. The other things I will do, so we'll do that dice just with the patient laying on the table in their natural position. And then at the end, I do a couple different maneuvers. One is I will alter the jaw position. So I'll do a gentle mandibular advancement, also called the Esmark maneuver. This is trying to simulate having a mandibular advancement device in while asleep. So I'll look at the obstructive patterns while the jaw is advanced compared to not. You don't want to advance this excessively because you're trying to mimic something a patient could tolerate all night. So I'll usually have my anesthesia colleague do this and I'll ask them to line it up so the incisors meet and I'll often even check with my finger to feel that that's um, about where they're advanced to. I also do a, a chin lift, so close the mouth and extend the neck a bit and it's surprising for some people this can make a pretty significant difference in their airway. This is simulating, again, neck extension, nasal breathing with mouth closure. And uh, two other interesting things that you can do, if you have a patient that has a mandibular advancement device that is beneficial, but they still have some residual OSA, you can actually have the mandibular advancement device in at the time of DICE to see where the residual obstruction is and to guide further treatment. There was a study showing that's primarily palate obstruction if they're still having OSA with a partially successful mandibular advancement device. And I won't get into this, but there are also some people that are doing DICE PAP, where during DICE, you can put the PAP on, you can look through one of the Bronk adapters. This is primarily best for folks that uh, are still having residual OSA with PAP, and then you can kind of see where the obstruction is happening and see if that can guide any further treatments. We use the VOTE classification for standard reporting of DICE results. This stands for VLIM, oral pharynx, lateral wall, tongue base, and epiglottis. You can rate each area along with the direction in which it's obstructing, whether it's AP, lateral, or concentric, and you give it a zero for no obstruction, one for partial, or two for total. And most everyone that does adult DICE uses this, which is nice that it's pretty standardized reporting. What are some common DICE findings? So here's a video of VLAM obstruction. So I have the flexible camera sitting just at the back of the septum looking down at the VLAM. You can see the uvula. I think we had a question earlier about big uvula. This patient has one. You can see it vibrating. They're clearly snoring. 
uvulus coming up into the nasopharynx. This I would classify as a complete AP palate obstruction. And then here we've moved the camera down past the soft palate. Now you can see the tongue base at the bottom of the screen, you clearly see the glottis, and you can see oral pharynx lateral wall, complete obstruction here. So the right and left lateral wall is completely obstructing. This tends to correlate, not always, but tends to correlate with neck circumference and BMI, higher BMIs having this type of obstruction. And then tongue base. So we're at a similar level that we were at at the prior visualization of the lateral wall obstruction, but here we can see the tongue base falling back, almost touching the posterior pharyngeal wall, even pushing the epiglottis back with it. And this you can distinguish from the next video, which is pure epiglottis obstruction without the tongue base impacting it. So here you can see the tongue base is well out of the way, but the epiglottis is just getting sucked back, and you can even see the vibration along with the snoring there. So finally, when do I do dice? This is controversial, but this is how, what I do. So anyone, when they are interested in Inspire and you're considering it as an option, at this point has to undergo dice. It is required because complete concentric collapse, CCC, at the VLAM is currently an exclusion criteria for the Inspire device, which is the only FDA-approved hypoglossal nerve stimulator currently. There are also, we'll talk about this at our panel tomorrow on hypoglossal nerve stimulators, but there are other dice findings that can predict success. Anyone that has recurrent or persistent OSA after a prior surgery, I will recommend this because then you can see <clears throat> what's going on in the scar tissue from their prior surgeries, or anyone that really has no clear area of obstruction on a wake exam and it is unclear what they may benefit most from. Some people would argue anyone who cannot tolerate PAP should undergo DICE, but like we talked about in the question and answer session earlier this morning, I think if there's a clear or you know, enlarged tonsils or edematous uvula, then I don't always do DICE for patients if I have a sense of what's going on while seeing them awake. But for the most part, these are, this is when I find DICE to be helpful. And that is it for me. We will talk more at the hypoglossal nerve stimulator session tomorrow evening. And we have a 